Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Jesus said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to Jesus a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. Jesus took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Athathatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened. And his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The Gospel of the Lord. I'm going to speak to you today about the fact that God has so much abundance that there is enough for everybody to be filled. Now, this is not something we often believe because we have this idea that there's only so much and therefore, we need to divide ourselves from one another. The fact that we divide ourselves from one another so frequently shows that we don't always believe this idea that there is enough. We have insiders and outsiders. We have the people who are good and the people who are bad. The people who are listening and those who aren't listening. The people who are our family and those who aren't. The people who are our church and those who aren't. The people who are part members of our country and those who aren't. The people who deserve service, the people who deserve compassion, and those who don't. The people we pay attention to and the people that we don't. <coughs> Democrats or Republicans. <laughs> and all the other ways we divide people from one another. People on the island and people who aren't. All of these ways that we seek to put divisions. The reason we make the divisions is because we don't believe there's enough. And if there's only so much, then we need to, to make a demarcation between those who will deserve for some reason to receive it and those who are just going to be on the outside because there's not enough for everyone, they're going to have to figure it out themselves. When Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, he talks about a kingdom of abundance. When we hear the scriptures this morning, we hear Jesus telling us that in God's vision, God makes the rich and the poor, God makes the Jews and the Gentiles, that God has enough abundance for everybody to be filled and everybody to be touched. This is what the kingdom of God looks like. In some ways, it's even the character of the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God is a kingdom where there are not divisions between insiders and outsiders, but where there is enough where everyone can be welcomed to the table. Jesus was eating one time in Jerusalem uh, when some of the religious leaders came to Jesus, and they immediately started drawing distinctions. They said, leader, how come your disciples eat with defiled hands, 
Uh, but the rules that we have, handed down from the elders, say that everyone has to wash their hands before we eat. Apparently, Jesus' disciples did not always wash their hands before they ate. <clears throat> what we see in this passage immediately is these religious leaders are coming to Jesus, and they're starting to make divisions, they're starting to make distinctions. And Jesus calls the crowd together, and what he says to them is, everybody listen, there's nothing outside of you that going in can make you be defiled. That is what comes out of the heart that defiles a person, because it's out of the heart that come evil intentions, that come murder, that come slander, that come division, that come um, uh, critique, that come all of the kinds of things where we harm one another and knock each other down. All of that comes from the heart. To make sort of a, a clear that, that, that there's another way, Jesus goes out to do something completely opposite of what he had encountered with those religious leaders. So help me think this through. So if, um, if the religious leaders were men and he's doing the opposite, who would he go to? A woman. Okay. If they're um, within the nation of Israel, then where would he go? Outside the nation of Israel. Okay, if they're people of, um, of power and status, then who would he go to? Somebody very, very low, right? If they were constantly concerned about themselves, then the person he would go to would be very concerned about what? Somebody else, right? So Jesus goes off to the region of Tyre. Now, does Tyre mean anything to you, T-Y-R-E? We know nothing about that region, right? That makes no sense to you, right? Did a little research this week. The parallel would be Jesus went to Afghanistan and was hanging out in the neighborhood where Osama bin Laden and all of his buddies were uh, constant uh, companions and neighbors. And everybody knew bin Laden and all of his buddies, and they were all part of one big team. And while he was sitting there in a room all by himself, a woman from that town walked up. Right? You're thinking, this is going to go south. Right? This is what Tyre, Tyre was a place that was so known for being antagonistic to Jewish people for literally almost a thousand years, right up to the very present. They were friends with Rome. They never supported the Israelites when they were trying to get their freedom. People from Tyre were like the worst people in the world. Jesus goes to the region of Tyre. And he tries to be quiet, which is to say he's not even announcing himself. Which shows even more the woman and, and, and uh, the, the, um, the um, I want to say benefit, the credit that we should give to the woman in seeking him out. This woman, this Seraphonician woman, lest we think maybe it was a Jewish person, a good person in this region. It was a Seraphonician woman herself who comes to Jesus and she says to Jesus, my daughter has a demon, please heal her. This is a great chance to draw divisions, isn't it? If there's only enough healing for some people, if God does not have abundance, then we would expect this is where it's going to be played out. And so Jesus says to her, hey, we've got to draw lines, don't we? We've got to make distinctions here. You know, there's Jewish people and there's everybody else. And there right now there's only enough for the Jewish people. So you're not going to be able to get enough. Now, it's not clear that Jesus believes this. But he's definitely saying it so we can see it and understand that's the subject going on. He may be just repeating what he's heard in, uh, in Israel from the religious leaders. He may be throwing this out to the woman to see if she's going to bite. Because if she was thinking division, what would she say? Jesus says, I'm sorry, there's only enough for the Jewish people. There's not enough for your people. If she was still in the division mindset, what would she say? She would say, yeah, but they've gotten enough. Or, yeah, but they do that stuff. And they do that stuff. They don't deserve all your blessings. Think about all the stuff that they've done. Think about how mean they've been to you sometimes. We deserve blessings, too. That would be going along with the division, going on with the sense, agreeing that there's not enough, and making an argument for why you should get it and not them. Right? Notice that that's not what she does. Jesus gives us this example of extraordinary holiness, of like the right mindset, and he's showing us that here it exists in a person who immediately we think should be on the other side. Someone who we've already cut out and thrown out and said, you're no longer part of us. 
He's showing that she is from the heart. In the heart she is. In the mind she is. In her faith she is. In her compassion she is. She does not go along with the distinction concept. What she says is, oh, it's not children versus dogs. If it's children versus dogs, then of course. But she sort of corrects Jesus or in some sense shows him her own thinking. He says, she says no. The children and the dogs are together. They're partners. If those are the two, if those are the two groups, they're all part of the family. Isn't your dog part of your family? Yeah, the dog, the children are eating, and the dogs are there at the table. When the children eat, guess what? The dogs eat. If you've ever had children, you know that. And you know why? If there was only a few crumbs, the kids would only get them. She's showing that not only does she believe that there is um, that, that there's one team, not two, even with different parts or different kinds or different cultures, that there's one team, not two, she also believes in the abundance. Because the crumbs don't fall unless there's a lot, unless there's plenty, unless there's more than enough. Have you ever been to a cruise ship uh, buffet? There's as much on the floor as there is on the... <laughs> People are like, oh, we're going to get the crab sticks. And there's crab sticks going everywhere. But they don't care. Because there's so much in front of them that if something falls, it's not a big deal. This is what she's saying. What she says to Jesus is, Jesus, I believe we're all on one team. I believe we're all part of one family. I believe we're all partners with each other. And I believe there's enough for everybody to get what they need. And Jesus says to her, he says, for saying this, the demon has left your daughter. Jesus is telling us that this mindset, this understanding has power. That when you believe this, there is so such power in this understanding that it casts out demons and brings forth wholeness. It erases distinctions and raises up in strength. Just the understanding itself. In fact, in the Greek, it doesn't necessarily say for saying this. It says for, for following this logic, um, for, for understanding this concept, the demon has left. There is enough abundance for everybody. And we show we don't believe it when we draw distinctions, but when we realize that we're all part of the same team, that's when the mindset starts to have so much power, it changes us and it changes our world. She, the woman, was not uh, in, in, in um, she did not believe she was distinct from her daughter, that it was her versus the daughter. My daughter gets healed, I won't. She was a partner with her daughter. She came to Jesus. She believed she was a partner with Jesus. I have a need, and you can help, and I believe you will. There's not even a distinction there. She came to him. She bowed down, but she believed he would care, that he would be on her team. She knew that Jesus was in partnership with God, that there wasn't a distinction there such that there wouldn't be sharing, and she knew that God was in partnership with everybody. And this is why the power. Our passage today ends with this bizarre story about Jesus and the deaf mute. Now here's a person who can't hear and can't speak. Can I suggest to you that the deaf mute, the whole reason it's right here in the passage is that it's a giant metaphor for everything. Who's the deaf mute? You and I, when we don't believe it. Why? Because we don't hear, we can't hear the truth, and therefore we can't speak the power. Who is the deaf mute? The religious leaders were. Who was the deaf mute? The, the, the nation of Israel in that time. Who is the deaf mute? Planet Earth. All of humanity. This is the story. This is the situation that when we don't hear and we don't speak this truth, that all of us are so blocked up, we are pitiful as a person, deserving of pity as the person who cannot hear and cannot speak. But what's the grace here? The grace is that Jesus is the one that opens it up. Jesus is the one who will, can put his hands in your ears, and Jesus will open your ears. You got to come to him. You got to trust him. You got to let him get that close that he can touch you, that he can come and put himself um, sort of like onto you, and that through him he can open you up. Notice the word he says, be opened. This is his word to you. Be opened to this truth. 
And then he takes his own mouth and, and sort of connects it to your mouth, that his mouth opens yours, that having heard, we can also speak, and by speaking, we can also receive. My friends, there is enough abundance in God for everybody. There's enough blessings, there's enough healing, there's enough favor, there's enough grace, there's enough power, there's enough resources, there's enough food, there's enough clothing, there's enough air, there's enough land, there's enough space, there's enough freedom for everybody to have. And when we understand and believe that and see all of ourselves as partners in faith, that's when the grace of God comes rolling, rolling down. If you are on the same page as me on this, will you say amen? Amen. Stand in, let us proclaim our faith. We believe in one God, Father.